This is a lecture, or maybe talk, happening in real time. Even though, according to the lecture talk itself, time is not real. I am here talking to you, even though, according to the talk lecture, I am at this very moment reading to you. I just said at this moment, even though, according to the lecture, or maybe talk, which is not actually a talk, I said, time is not real. To make matters worse, I am talking, or as it were, not talking to you in real space, this actual space where I stand looking out and not seeing you. But I don't mean to say to you that I'm not talking to you. I wouldn't want to take you to take this wrong. I have nothing against talking to you, and I don't actually prefer reading to you. The occasion of my being here, born of the desire to celebrate the powerful transformative work of Arakawa and Madeleine Ginz, calls for precise distinctions and an appropriate mode of discourse that I would not be sure of creating in an actual talking situation. I'm not David Anton. I'm not even Charles Bernstein, who's here in the dark somewhere. So I thought of calling this a writing piece, or maybe just writing, but that wouldn't cover the proposed interruption of time and space that I intend by the word lecture, which at root, of course, comes from Latin, legere, to read. If I call this a talk, you might not be bothered if I read to you, especially if you're living the academic life, but after David Anton, I wouldn't dare. And yet, even the term lecture is far from accurate, given my intention of carrying this discourse into places I consider more appropriate to the transformative implications of our Kawagens, if I may say their two names, as many do, as if they were one person, which of course they are not, but then neither does it feel right to speak of them as two, since after all the many ways they create a single work or perhaps a single multiple, or maybe a multiple singularity moving unitedly in its very mode of unbounded singleness. This raises the problem of identity, which of course comes from the Latin neuter idem, which even non-academics know means the same. And these two people are definitely not the same, any more than they're neuter. But according to this indefinitely represented semi-communicative discourse, identity is no more real than time or space. That is, the category real is hardly adequate to contain all the things that we actually experience in relation to them, such that they are. Let's go back in time, or let's go back to time. Well, we can't actually go back to time any more than we can go back in time, which so far we can't. That is, we can't go back to anything without believing in time, which according to this composition, I don't really believe in, at least not wholeheartedly. I'm trying to say this in a very straightforward way, but the difficulties of creating a precise discourse worthy of celebrating Arakawa Gens, that wonderful self-varying sameness that persons, throws curveballs inside communication, or maybe a better metaphor would be the need to keep many balls in the air at once, or forgive me, many curveballs. Anyway, time. You know what I mean most of the time when I say time. We depend on it, which is an act of confidence that doesn't require a special act of belief. Even without believing in time, we do fairly well handling time issues. And rest assured that even though I don't believe in time, I respect it and hope that my timing isn't off and that I stick within my time limits here today. And I hope you'll still be talking to me, even if we're not sure in what sense I'm still talking to you. In this respect, time is perspectival, like space. How long we stand, where we stand, and what we perceive, no matter how much we challenge the reality of time and space, they bounce back into relatively stable position in our experience. We can both doubt them and yet rely on them for basic orientation. They persist the way breathing persists, as essentials of living. They are of the body as of the mind. Indeed, the hypnotic power of time and space bespeak the inseparability of mind and body as much as anything does that we can barely live a single minute without their drifting apart again. I think about my body 
maybe even obsess about it, even as I feel things about what I think, and yet I know they aren't really separate. Likewise, I don't believe time is real in the same sense that I am real, and yet it has a reality capable of perplexing me a lot of the, well, you see, I have to say it, time. And I admit that I'm time challenged, while I'm willing to believe, which I'm willing to believe is genetic. <laughs> but the beliefs I live by are themselves not real. They serve my crude efforts at self-orientation by way of self-stabilization. And I agree with Ezra Pound that belief is a cramp of the mind in a certain position. But is there an alternative to belief, to time, to space, to a mode of existence in which we are fated in the separation of body and mind? The short non-answer is not decide. Stand in the middle, which is pretty much the same thing as standing on the edge or between two edges. That's called a threshold, a lyman, which is the area of being between one thing and another thing, and it's not a comfortable place to be. It feels like being somewhere between hopelessly indecisive and way out on a limb. So, my voice is speaking to you, and I don't know if it's possible to know when I'm reading or when I'm speaking, because actually our voice is alive and has a complete life of its own, and it has its own mode of belief. It's not possible to not believe, let's face it. The senses are time-space oriented. They believe in time and space. And then there's the sixth sense, the sixth sense that physiologists now believe in as a true sense all in itself, proprioception. Proprioception. The sense by which we know where we are, how we are, how we're here, and in what state we're here, balancing, positioning, in space, verticality, how we are human, how the human is the only, only creature, really, that has this double curve kind of spine that causes us to move forward in this flowing way in which we are always on edge and always in danger of losing ourselves to gravity. So there's a kind of principle involved in proprioception. It's the principle of how we are oriented in time and space. The question is, am I reading to you or am I speaking to you? Actually, I'm doing both. Because it's not possible for me to stay in the mode of reading before living people very long and be comfortable with what I'm doing. So I'm engaging in a kind of vocal proprioception. I'm trying to find out what I have to say and what it's like to say it right now and what language is doing as I'm saying it, what I am, where I am. I'm kind of reading as I talk. That is to say, I'm reading words on the page, and I'm also reading thoughts as they come to me. And this is a kind of further reading, a kind of further reading of the world. And here I want to credit, what do I call them? I thought of calling them Ginzakawa. <laughs> That's actually kind of interesting, because first of all, it sort of works in Japanese. And second of all, it implies that we don't know who they are. We don't know who anybody is by their name, and yet we rely on that. We're here surrounding the name Arakawa Gens. So if we change that, we have to radically reorient ourselves to those two people as one person, etc. So this is about the poetics of self-orientation. And I say that that's related to the poetics of blank, because it's about the further languaging of the world. It's not about whether language or architecture or real space or real time or how I speak or what language is, except that we know that language is alive. That is, say, it has a will of its own. It comes and goes, and our thoughts follow, and we're conditioned by it. So we're raising the question about the function of language. But now I want to do this the hard way. What steps, if the words be given to themselves? What steps? And if it is hearing between even the fastest beats.
Thank you.